Hello, hi, welcome again. This is your agronomist farm with Fred. Uh, and today I want to take you through some few steps or uh, some few managerial practices when it comes to butternut or squash farming. Uh, like I've always told you, butternut and watermelon are almost similar when it comes to managing them, though butternut requires less attention or less work as compared to, 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 to watermelon. And uh, one of the biggest reasons I usually encourage farmers, especially the starter farmers, to do butternut or to farm butternut is one, they need less capital to invest in. Two, uh, they don't need, uh, they have a wide market. So if you have butternut, you don't need to struggle them with the market or uh, uh, marketing them. Three, the shelf life of the fruit is now what is of uh, most important. All it's very interesting to me because you can store them in a store for as many months as possible. If the the market is not promising, you'll still have your fruit and you sell when you want. So. You can see the germination was very good and we are in a very good stage which is a vegetative stage and at this stage uh, I want just to take you a few steps on what you're supposed to do, the things you're supposed to look at and how to manage this young crop. One, you are supposed to make sure you give it enough water. So many farmers have been asking uh, all of coming with a question on the amount of water they're supposed to use in the watermelon farming, in onions farming, or in a project in uh, butternut farming. And uh, I don't have a specific amount of water one is supposed to use, but use enough water. For the starters, those who have not yet started farming, one of the things you're supposed to consider before you start farming, make sure you consider water is supposed to be a factor. Don't accept to lease a, a land or don't lease a farm where there is no water or where there is less water because water is everything and water is farming. So if you want to get into farming, make sure you have enough water so that you can have a suit farming. So uh, uh, when it comes to uh, fall irrigation, for those who are using fall irrigation, you'll use more water than I use compared to drip irrigation. If you're in a position to invest in drip irrigation, invest in drip irrigation because it's very economical in a uh, water application. Drip irrigation is uh, uh, very economical uh, when it comes to managing or when to to open water and when to close or when to, to irrigate or and when to not irrigate because you can do it at any time but when it comes to now to, to uh, far irrigation like the one I'm doing it's very hectic, it's very tiring especially when it comes to, to irrigation so uh, you don't need to do 10 acres or as many acres as possible of uh, drip irrigation you can just start with a small portion of drip irrigation, then continue increasing your size as time goes on. Because this is a good practice, but not as economical as drip irrigation. Drip irrigation is the way, and it is the future of farming. We need to have it all, all of us, so that we can succeed in everything that we're doing. Soon, I'm doing it. So, at vegetative stage, you need to look at several things, among them the health of the crop. As you can see, the plant has already started uh, uh, moving from the water source. Now it's creeping towards where uh, it's adding to, uh, to form the fruit. Now it's vegetating, it is forming, uh, it's developing new shoots. As you can, uh, you can see, new shoots are developing from one plant. And uh, the main plant is also uh, developing leaves. And now we are at a very important stage that you should be very observant when, uh, uh, when approaching this stage. One, 
you are supposed to make sure you keep this uh, plant healthy and very well green. Keeping it green and keeping it healthy, first approach is the fertilizer that you use. At this stage, don't do a, a mixer of fertilizer like uh, I met a farmer is doing a calcium, is doing potassium, is doing phosphorus. No, remember we started with a phosphorus based fertilizer in order to enable this plant to be the way it is. And that's why you see it's very healthy. As you can see, the all of this uh, field, it's very healthy. So now we want to come to the, to the next stage where we prepare the plant because it is adding to, fall, to flowering stage and we want, by the time it's flowering, it's very energetic, it's very strong so that it can give us good flowers that will form a good fruit. So at this stage, we need to concentrate with the nitrogenous rich fertilizer. And in most cases, a rich fertilizer in, uh, that we use here has high nitrogen and low phosphorus, but zero potassium. Don't use potassium at this age. Don't use calcium at this age. It's not important. Yes, it won't harm the plant, but you'll be, you'll, lose, you'll be losing the fertilizer. You need to be very economical. You cannot use all the fertilizers at a go because you lose some and you gain some. So at this stage, use a nitrogenous fertilizer and I usually uh, the only fertilizer that is use is available a uh, fertilizer with with phosphorus and nitrogen like 2323 can be found anywhere so you can use that fertilizer in order to boost the health and the vegetative vegetation of this young plant also uh, you are not limited to using foliars the same uh, approach will happen Whatever you use for the base of the uh, the base of fertilizer uh, for for these uh, the nitrogenous also the foliar take a foliar that is rich in, in 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 nitrogen because that is what will give us good vegetation will give us as many stems as possible so when this one is forming flowers will not will be in a position also to make sure we have healthy flowers also direct. We also direct these young uh, seedlings so that they can move to ones where they're supposed to be lying. Because I told you these are the beds. When from this line, they will all come to this bed. The other line, they will come to, uh, they will meet here. So you have to be very cautious on the two. Then for the pest and the diseases, at this stage, because it's vegetating, uh, as you can see, it's vegetating well. What we usually do, we use a, uh, if uh, uh, we protect it against any cutting insect or anything that may come to uh, to eat the, the the leaves. They are very they are very good. They are very green, and so many animals may be attracted by them. Among them, the the, the, the caterpillars, uh, and also the white flies and the spider mites. So. For the white flies and spider mites, if you want to identify them, you look at the lower part of the leaf. Uh, if you see the whitish flies, like the one I'm seeing here, this one here, this is a white fly. This is an indication that uh, we may be attacked by white flies soon. Don't ignore even a single white fly. Don't ignore even, because this one, this what bleeds and uh, blends in as many white flies as possible. So, at this point, we are supposed to start controlling the white flies and also controlling the, the, the caterpillars I told you about that are eating uh, the, these leaves because we want to have a good leaf coverage and also uh, to have a, a, a strong crop. So, from white flies and uh, uh, mites and for mites also you see you see them on the lower part if you want to test to know whether you have mites the red spider mites you use dust if you're in a position pour it on the lower part of the leaf then tap this is how we do it you pour it the dust on the lower part of the leaf then tap the leaf if you see a web like thing holding your dust which is not pleasant as per now, you see how black like coating the dust. That is an indication that lead spider mite is available. But don't wait until 
you see the red spider mite. You are supposed to be a protective, or to do a protective mechanism in order to control the lead spider mite. Don't wait until you see them. From lead spider mite, I think the two, the, 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 the white flies and the red spider mite, those are the threat as per this stage, which is vegetative stage. And use a good fertilizers and control those pests and you'll be good to go. For the diseases, we control the portal mildew. Portal mildew is always seen at the surface of the leaf. At this, at the surface of the leaf, and for portal mildew, we can use like this. For portal mildew, it's a brown is it's a grayish substance uh, that is on top of the leaf, and product leaching as oxystrobin are good in controlling uh, portal mildew. And for downy mildew, it's always at the lower part of the leaf, as the name suggests. Podal mildew comes when it's very hot and dry, that's when podal mildew comes. Downy mildew is always seen when it's very cold and humid. So you're supposed to differentiate the two because of the weather condition or where the disease is. Those, those are the threats, uh, uh, fungal diseases, and the pests that you mentioned, if you control that, you'll be good. You'll have as healthy crop as the one you've seen here. And this does... The beginning we haven't achieved what we want because i'm telling you we are headed to the to the flowering stage which is very critical and we need to take care of these crops and make sure they grow as healthy as they are because the healthier the crop the many the flowers and the many the fruit and the bigger the fruit so if you observe that you'll have a very good squash and you'll be a good farmer if you have a comment, uh, if you have a, a, a question, leave it on the comment uh, section. Also, you can follow me on my social media at Farm with Fred on Facebook, Farm with Fred on TikTok, Farm.Fred on Instagram, and Farm with Fred uh, on Twitter. Also, on my personal uh, Twitter handle at FredMonene underscore. Follow me there, ask me any question. Let's get in uh, connected together so that we can continue this journey together, educating each other and growing together. Bye.